So I'm walking around today, and I'm picking up. There's a little theme going on. And so I grab a pen, and I start writing it down. i got to share this with you. Unbelievable. There are people who are having, no kidding, they're having their wedding anniversary today. I bumped into Bill and, and Ruth Chobatar. I'll start with the, uh, the youngest. And uh, their kids, Todd and Janine Chobatar down in Orlando, they're celebrating their 22nd anniversary. Wow. <laughs> and then I go into Sabbath school with Ella because I want to be with Ella and Isabel in Sabbath school. And Bruce Kloss is up front leading. And I find out Bruce and Linda Kloss are celebrating number 36 today. And I show up in First Church and find out that these beautiful flowers are in honor of Ben and Sandy Chilson who are celebrating their number 50 today. And then I'm talking in the hallway about this, and I bump into Glenn Johnson, who informs me that he and Carlene are celebrating their number 62 today. Wow. And as it turns out, Karen and I are celebrating our number 44 today. So what's up with that? You know, we got married right after they invented electricity, so I know that's been a while ago, but uh, can you believe that? So I have a little poem I wrote for all the men in these couples. In, in, I spent some time in this uh, poem a poem I've written for all the men in these anniversaries. And there, there may be others that are celebrating it. Here's the poem. It's not real long, but it's still a poem. Roses are red. <laughs> Have you heard this one before? <laughs> are you serious? I would write something and you've already heard it. Roses are red. Violets are blue. I'm forever grateful to God because I fell in love and married you. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Put your hands together for all these couples. They're out there. God bless them. You're having an anniversary in the, in the June is wedding month, so you're going to have an anniversary this month. Please receive our, our very best wishes that God will make the next chapter ahead of you even better than what you've had. He is so good. Yeah. All right, I want to pray, and then I'm, I'm really excited about this teaching. Let's get to it right now. Dear Father, a full morning in worship, but that's what happens when we come to your house. Thank you for worship today. And we're glad we didn't have to come alone, that there are people sitting around us, strangers, but we're still together. And now we come to the moment when we turn to your Word, and we want the Word to speak, in speak an intelligible word that we can pick up and take into the busy life. So may that be the case today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I say the Ravens, those who are sports-minded among us immediately think of the NFL franchise in what city? In Baltimore. Baltimore Ravens, right? But when I say the raven singular, the, liter the literary-minded among us, they immediately think of Edgar Allan Poe and his poem, The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, when I pondered weak and weary, quoth the raven, nevermore. And when I say raven singular, to the Bible-minded among us, they immediately think of Noah who opens the windows of the ark, and <laughs> there goes that raven trying to find anywhere to land. Nope, home again. And to the same Bible-minded among us, when I say the ravens, plural, nobody thinks about Jesus. Everybody thinks about Elijah. When in fact, Jesus has very much to do with the ravens, as we're about to find out. But first, the story of Elijah. So I want to go to that story. Once upon a time, in the sweet incense, the servant fan-waving throne room of a wicked king, a rogue prophet shows up. Let's go. First Kings chapter 17. Open your Bible to First Kings chapter 17. And while you're doing that, if we can just get the volume down just a tad. We're getting a, a bit of a ring up here, guys. Bless you. First Kings chapter 17, verse 1. I'll be in the New International Version today. Oh, by the way, while, while you're finding First Kings 17 in the Old Testament, this is number two in our series, Gone with the Birds, Lessons from the Divine Ornithologist. Eagles last week, ravens today. I wonder what next Sabbath is going to be. Just five Sabbaths in June, but a different bird every time. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead 
said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, before whom I stand, some of your translations read, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next two years except at my word. It's just like a hand grenade. He just tosses that hand grenade into the Oval Office and then walks away. Boom, he's gone. And before the king can say, get it, he's gone, disappeared. Verse 2. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, quick, quick, go, 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 go. Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have commanded. Some of your translations read, I have commanded the what? The ravens to supply you with food there. Here they are, featured bird number two. And sure enough, verse 5, so Elijah did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there, and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Do you know the difference between a raven and a crow? Hmm? I didn't either. You know what I thought? I'm embarrassed to tell you this because this is how ignorant I am. I thought raven and crow were just synonyms for the same bird. Wrong. I found out this week that they're very different. Oh, my, very different, the raven and the crow. Same family, but very different. In fact, let me share with you the differences. I got them scribbled down right here. Ravens are bigger than crows. Yeah, they're a little huskier. <clears throat> Number two, crows go, ha, ha, ha. Something like that. <clears throat> I ought to quit trying. <laughs> I ought to quit trying to talk like these birds. What are you, bilingual, Dwight? No, I'm not. Uh, crows go, which you just heard, <laughs> and raven. No, seriously, ravens go crow, crow, crow. So the crows go ha ha ha. Yeah, you got the difference. Okay, number three, ravens travel in pairs, and they are mated for life. Happy anniversary! They're mated for life. Not crows. Crows fly alone or fly in, fly in flocks that are called murders. That's the technical name. They're called murders. Oh, flock of crows. And finally, in flight, ravens have a wedge-shaped tail so that when they put the tail out, it looks very flat because the feather lengths are different. Crows have the same length, and so it looks like a fan. And that's how you're going to be able to tell them. You'll be able to tell the difference. But ravens and crows, listen to this, choir. Ravens and crows have one stunning similarity, and that is because they are part of the Corvid family, their brains, get this, their brains are among the largest in all the bird kingdom. Largest brains. In fact, did you know that the brain body weight ratio for ravens is the same as the apes, the whales, and the humans? They're very smart. So when I told you about the, told the kids about this little BBC clip, you got to, not now, please, but this little clip, you got to watch it. Watch it after dessert today. It's fascinating. You, you're going to watch an American crow, a North American crow. You're going to watch him go through an amazing eight-step sequential problem-solving maze, and you're going to say, how did he do that? There's only one way that you and I as friends of God would respond. <laughs> God gave him a very, they're the brainiacs of the bird kingdom, a very bright mind, which explains why God could come to the ravens. I imagine it was just two ravens. If they travel in pairs, it's just two ravens. And he comes to the ravens. He says, Mr. and Mrs. Raven, I need some help with this man named Elijah. I need you. I'm going to provide breakfast and I'll provide supper, but I need you to be the uh, room service. I need you to go to where he is and I'll tell you where he is and you'll find him. Morning. And I want you to give him bread and meat. And come back in the evening, bread and meat. Did you get that, ravens? <coughs> Got it. And that's exactly what they did. Intelligent. I mean, these birds are, I hate to tell you about this, but these birds are really shysters. They're a bunch of crooks. They're stealing each other's food all the time. And that's why the raven has learned, if you hide the food, your cache of food, nobody will see and that's why ravens will fake like they're hiding their food. And all their buddies are watching. <laughs> they didn't hide a thing. They're gone. And they hide it somewhere else. Ravens have been known to summon wolves. Wolves, come over here. I don't know how they do it. But they get the wolves there when they find a carcass because the ravens can't tear a carcass open. They need the wolves to rip it open, and then they'll go and pick supper or breakfast. They're smart. The juvenile ravens, get this, juvenile ravens have been seen and observed to climb a snowbank and then slide down on their rump, turn around and run right back up. 
slide down again. There is no biological purpose for this. They are just having fun. No kidding. They're social creatures. They will take twigs, cut them up into little parts so that they can play social games together. Now you know where you got it from. Same creator. And so in obedience, in obedience to that creator's command, the ravens, we just read it, bring Elijah breakfast and supper every single day. Now, look, it's not a menu with a whole lot of variety. It's just bread and meat. And the Hebrew is bread and meat, bread and meat. It's not a menu for a vegetarian, certainly not for a vegan. But, you know, when they're when running out of food, that's what you get. Which, by the way, in all essence, is really a tribute. It's not a tribute to these smart ravens. It's a tribute to the intelligent designer of this universe who equipped his creation to respond to him. I mean, you think about it. I don't suppose the creator is ever without help. All he has to do is go... Or come... Or somebody purring, some big cat purring up against him. The creator, if, if the creator needs transportation, he summons a whale. A hey, whale, I need you. Transport. Jesus said, if you, if you tell these people to, keep sh to shut their mouths, I'll tell you what, the rocks will become a choir of praise. They will start singing to me. If God needs a spokesman because he's got a recalcitrant prophet, the donkey starts talking. That's just the way it is. All of creation loves the creator except the human race and one-third of the angels. Go figure. Go figure. But even if you're a friend of God, the truth is... If nature goes berserk, you reap the consequences. And that's exactly what happens here. Look at this. Look at verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Elijah said, not until you hear from me again, you wicked king, will you get rain. He, he has to bear the brunt of it. So the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord comes to Elijah. And he says, Elijah, listen, you got to get out of here. We're going to put you in a, we're going to put you in a pagan land. Ahab will never think of looking for you there. And when you get to that little village, it'll be a pagan village. You will see a little lady outside the walls of the village. She will be picking up sticks. And then that's what I need you to do. And sure enough, Elijah does that. He goes, he goes into that pagan land of Sidon, and there's a there is Zarephath, there is a woman. By the by this point, would you be saying? You can count on God. It's all happened exactly as he was told. And he says, my dear woman, I am a stranger. <laughs> she, she looked up. She could tell just by looking at him. What are we talking about? We're talking about camel hair, leather garment, mantle over his shoulder, bushy beard, thick eyebrows. He's also a holy man. The woman can figure it out. He's a holy man. And he speaks like an Israelite. Dear woman, I'm from out of town, and I am so hungry and thirsty. Could you please go back to your home and make a little bread for me and some water? Bring it to me, and I'll leave you alone. And the woman looks at him as the Lord your God, as Yahweh your... I've heard of the name of your God. As Yahweh your God lives, let me tell you something, buddy. I'm picking up sticks right now for the last little fire. I have a little oil, a little flour. My son and I will have our last supper together, and then it's finis will die. Elijah sees the, the anguish on that woman's countenance, and he says, woman, 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 woman. Don't be afraid. My God will take care of you if you first do this. Something about the man prompts her. She does. Now read the ending. Read the ending of the story here, verse 15. And so she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. Verse 16, for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. I'm telling you what, ladies and gentlemen, it is absolutely true. God will take care of you. He will take care of you. If, like Elijah, if, like the widow, you make God first, he will make it last and last and last. If you first make God first. That's no quid pro quo. That's, do you really want me? 
That's all it is. Do you really want me? Because I run the whole universe. Let's talk about ravens for, for one more moment. There's an interesting little couplet that I found getting ready for this message today. A, a two little lines. I'm going to run them by you, put them on the screen. They're in your study guide. It's a take-home study guide. No fill in the blanks. Let's put the first one up. Job 38, verse 41. God is talking to Job. He said, okay, Job, where were you? Where were you? Who did this? Who did this? Who did this? These are all rhetorical questions. We know the answer is God. You did. You did. You did. But he's trying to make a point to Job. And he says, hey, Job, who provides food for the raven when it's young? Cry out. Cry out. When it's young, cry out to God and wander about for lack of food. Who do you suppose does that? And, and, and if we don't get it because it's a rhetorical question, and we're not aware that we, the answer is embedded in the question, the psalmist comes along in Psalm 147, verse 9, and he answers the question for us. He, God, provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. Can you believe that? <laughs> He fi the little ravens call to him. God hears them calling, and he says, get food to them. Get food to them. Help mama get that. Help papa get that food. Leading us to this stunning assumption. Apparently, the creator of the universe, get this, listen, listen. Apparently, the creator of the universe 24-7 is monitoring all his creation, including you and me, 24-7. We are so excited to have Kirk and Chelsea with us. I mean, are we high-fiving ours? And Karen and I get them for seven days. Wow. Let me tell you about their little girls, precious little girls, Ella, four, four and two-thirds, and uh, Isabel's just three months old. But anyway, they bring, they, 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 they've got this gizmo. I tell you, high-tech parenting. What's up with that? They got this gizmo. They can put the gizmo up in one room, put another part of the gizmo in the room where little Ella is taking a nap or in the middle of the night is sleeping. And do you know what? This high-tech this high tech piece is a video, audio, infrared monitor that keeps Mother Chelsea in instantaneous visual auditory touch with her sleeping girl day or night. You can't believe it. And let me tell you, more than that, this is a wonder drug. More than that. Chelsea or Kirk can get right up to that device, push a button, and it happens. They speak, and the little girls who cannot see mother or father anywhere hear the voice of their parent. Get back to bed. <laughs> Just like God. 24-7 monitor. He doesn't even have to show up. He just sends a voice, and he plays down this little infrared. In the middle of the night, he's watching you. Infrared, in the middle of the night, he says, I have a word for you. And you hear it. You don't see him, but you hear it. That's the God of the universe. Day and night, constantly monitoring the plight, the needs, the safety, the wants, the cries of his little creatures like you and me. And when the young little ravens croak, 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 when they cry out for food, the heart of God is touched. Help that mother get some food, will you? Which, by the way, is a perfect segue to Jesus and his own comments. You didn't know that Jesus actually made some comments about ravens. You know why? Because we're so enamored with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, and we don't realize that Luke has cut up that Sermon on the Mount and spread it all the way through his gospel, that when one of the cut-up pieces is rendered in Luke, it's not like in Matthew. And I'm going to show this to you, the last chapter that we're in. So we, we leave 1 Kings 17, and we go to Luke 12, because we want some red letters before we leave this building. Luke chapter 12. Please find Luke 12, verse 22. Luke 12, verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, that would be you and me, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. Ooh, it just says birds in Matthew. Consider the ravens, Luke adds. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. It's as if Jesus, who was, by the way, poor as a church mouse, Poor as a church mouse. It's as if Jesus is saying, yo, human beings, fellow human beings, think with me. Why do you worry? Why are you fretting? Why do you have this, this knot in your stomach that is, gets tighter by the day? Why are you anxious? Don't you understand that the God of the universe who is your personal creator 
is able to handle every detail of your life. Don't you think you're worth more than the ravens that he makes sure get food? Amen. Rhetorical questions, and we know the answer. Of course. Aren't you more valuable? In fact, Luke puts that little device in there to remind us. He's already, Jesus has already said that in verse 6. So just go back to the, to the top of uh, chapter 12, verse 6. Jesus speaking, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Go to the last part of verse 7. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Ken Logan, our minister of music. It's always a pleasure to be partnered with him in worship planning. Ken Logan has been composing some choral music and came across this delightful but poignant quatrain by the English poet John Bannister Tabb. You have these four lines in your study guide. You'll take them home with you. This was composed back in 1900. He, called, he titled this uh, quatrain, Holy Ground. I'll put it on the screen for you. Pause. And the poet made sure that's in all caps. Pause. He wants us to slow down. Come on. Slow down. Slow down. Pause. Where apart the fallen sparrow lies and lightly tread for there the pity of a father's eyes enshrines the dead. How tender and how true. 24-7, even the sparrows are being monitored. And when one falls, God marks the spot. Oh, I love this from Desire of Ages. Please put it on the screen. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground without the father's notice. Satan's hatred against God leads him to hate every object of the Savior's care. He seeks to mar the handiwork of God, and he delights in des destroying even the dumb creatures. Hit the pause button right there. If Satan could get his hands on every, every squirrel, one hand here and one hand here, do you know what he would do? Just wring the neck. Kill him. Just kill him. We don't need... I hate this music. Kill it. Every creature he would destroy... Guess who's been on your tail from the day you were born? Every day, waiting for his chance. Uh, keep re read that last line. It is only through God's protecting care that the birds are preserved to gladden us with their songs of joy. 24-7, the creator of the universe, monitoring his creation. My, 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 my. Our little girl, Chrissy, she had a pet hamster named Patches. You know, you know, can you picture a hamster? Big fluff of fur, hamster, okay? So we, had, we went to Walmart and bought this little hamster cage, and they have these little, uh, you know, these little things in them. So the hamster just running around. That's all the hamster does. And Chrissy just loved that little Patches. She'd feed it. She'd clean the little cage and... One night as she was getting ready to go to bed, we noticed that Patches was not behaving. Very lethargic, very lethargic, not his energetic self. What's going on with Patches? We tried to get some water in him. Maybe he needs more water. You can't force a hamster to eat. So did the water. We put Chrissy to bed, and she prayed for Patches. But before going to bed ourselves, we happened to check in on Patches. And you guessed it, Patches is dead. Just a little blob of fur, calico fur. We, just, we debate, shall we tell her now or shall we wait till the morning? But if we wait till the morning, she said, when did it happen? And uh, let's go tell her now. And so we tiptoed into Chrissy's darkened bedroom where Ella's sleeping right now. And, and, and we, I said, Chrissy, Chrissy. And she opened her eyes. You know how your kids open their eyes when they're just still asleep. And she sees, oh, it's Daddy. And so there's just this little angelic smile on her face. Why is he waking me up? I said, Chrissy, we just checked on Patches. We have some bad news. Patches died. And I tell you what, I'll never forget this moment. As long as I live, she's still, her head on the pillow, she's looking straight into my face. And you know how the child can just lie there without moving, and that reservoir that is behind the eyelids, that dam just begins to fill. She doesn't say a word. It just starts overflowing. My heart was broken. I knew about this quotation. 
And I thought to myself, God, kill him. Sorry to admit that. We don't need any more of him on this planet. God doesn't need any more of him on this planet. It's the children here that he's desperately scrambling. Get, get as many of these kids, and then I'm pulling the plug. Just get as many of them as you can. This week, Andrews University was stunned with the news, the tragic news that one of our own working at Lithotech, a young mother, Tracy Seisenstick, coming home from a ball game Sunday night, Head-on collision. Gone. Do you understand that the father of this universe is with her parents right now, huddled over them, holding them as close as he can? You know who did this? We just read it. Jesus said in Matthew 13, an enemy did this. We live where the enemy still reigns. In fact, on that same page in Desire of Ages, I'll put this line on the screen for you. Not a sigh is breathed, not a pain felt, not a grief pierces the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. Aren't you worth more than five sparrows to him? The Creator turned human asks us, why are you afraid? Why do you fret? Won't he take care of you? Even in death. Won't he have the last word? Make God first, and he will make it last, and one day last and last and last forever. Uh, Jesus again here, red letter words last time. Verse 22, Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, about your body, what you'll wear. For life is more than food, the body's more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They don't sow a reef. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Now, final line, verse 31. So seek God's kingdom, and all these things that you're fretting about will be added to you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, as the King James puts it. Make God first, and he'll make it last. He did it for Elijah. He did it for the widow. He's done it for millions and millions of human beings. He does it for the little ravens. He will take care of you. I promise. No, he promises. I will take care of you. I will take care of you. I don't know what is the knot in your stomach today. Some of you are so now bound up in fear and anxiety. You have hardly the courage to face a new day. You can face that new day because the Creator who designs you is beside you 24-7. He will take care of you. I love this line from education. Only in the light that shines from Calvary can nature's teaching be read aright. Through the story of Bethlehem and the cross, let it be shown how good it is to conquer evil and how every blessing that comes to us is a gift of redemption. It's all through the cross. It's all through the cross. Every blessing, every blessing. So I get a letter, email from one of our viewers. All right? I'm sure a very dear person. I have no idea who she is. I have no idea where she lives. Not in this area. And the email begins this way. Okay, Pastor Dwight. I want to tell you something. When you get an email and the first words are, okay, okay, Pastor Dwight. Ooh, what's following? I took the tithe challenge. Now, what she's talking about? Well, one of our outlets is still playing uh, sermons from two, three, four years ago. And at one time I said, hey, listen, let's, you don't believe that God can take care of you? Give him a 90-day test. Give him a 90-day test and say, God, I want to return everything that's yours. First 10%, that's tithe, that's yours. You can have it all. I just give him 90 days and see if he'll not come in. So she writes, I took the tithe challenge now, all caps, this month, the third month, my Social Security income. She's on fixed income. Went from 868 to 725 per month because the state stopped paying my Medicaid health care and I have to pay for my own out of my own income. Tell me how that is a blessing for returning to God his tithe. I'm saying aloud with Job, though he slay me, I will trust him, all caps. Please pray for my feeble faith, my struggling faith. Thank you in advance. 
I'll let you know how God answers our prayer. Ooh, pressure's on. This came the 1st of April. 22 days later, here comes her answer. And it doesn't begin with okay. <laughs> I recently emailed you to tell you that I took your 90-day tie challenge and my Social Security income dropped by over $100. I told you that I trusted God because I don't believe he lies. And when he said to prove, all caps, prove him, so I did. I just needed prayer to keep my faith strong. Well, I checked my balance today, and instead of the 100 there was $285 in my account. Wow. And I know what you're thinking. You are thinking, you know what? That's chump change. Big deal going from 100 to 285. But my friend, that's precisely my point. This little widow who had very little got more. And you, with all that you have, are you trusting the same creator God? Or are you holding it all for yourself? This is mine. I earned it. Nobody gets this. Is that what you're doing? Ah. What could lead a little widow with an email to take on this challenge? Oh, she found a, a promise and a command. I want to share with you what she found. It's Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. You've probably read this before, but may I read it in your hearing? God speaking, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and test me. Prove, all caps she puts it, King James. Prove me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I want you to test me, God says, because I know that what I've just commanded you is counterintuitive. I know that it doesn't make sense to give a tenth away and then expect to have more when the, when, when, the, when the month is over. I understand that, but I rule the universe, and I need your permission. If you will return what is mine, because it's not yours anyway, if you will return what is mine, you're telling me I need you to run the whole shebang for me. I will run the entire outfit for you if you tell me I'm first. Make me first, and I will make it last, and last, and last. Make me first. That's because I'm not going to break your free choice. I have to know, am I first? Show me. You show me. I'll step right in. Make me first, and I will make it last, not just for 90 days. Not just for 90 years, but do you know what? I'll make it last forever and ever. Even to Tracy's family, I make that promise. Forever and ever, I will restore her one day soon. And forever and ever, you have her. Make me first. And I'll make it last and last and last. Just ask Elijah. Just ask that little widow. Just ask the widow with the email. Just ask the ravens, make him first, and he will make it last and last and last. I don't know about you, but I want to say amen to that promise. How about it? Think of the last time someone said, I'm praying for you. Didn't it give you a sense of peace and reassurance that somebody cares for me? I know how I feel when I get an email from one of our viewers saying, Yo, Dwight, I've been praying for you lately. There's nothing like knowing someone is praying for you. So I want to offer you an opportunity to partner. Let me, let us partner with you in prayer. If you have a special prayer request or a praise of thanksgiving you'd like to share with us, I'm inviting you to contact one of our friendly chaplains. It's simple to do. You can call our toll-free number, 877, the two words, His Will, 877 his will. That friendly voice that answers, you tell him, you tell her what your prayer need is. We'll join with you in that petition. And may the God who answers prayer journey with you these next few days until we're right back here together again next time.